Hi, I'm Jay Burney. I'm the U.S. Chair of the Birds on the Niagara 2021 International Bird Festival. Welcome to our keynote presentation. I'm very proud tonight to announce the BON21 keynote speaker, Jay Drew Lanham. The last several years have been very challenging in the United States. Both the pandemic and politics have changed the way we live, think, and act. These U.S. challenges affect the people of Canada and people across the world, which is one of the reasons that it's been such a pleasure and an important pleasure to work on a binational birding festival, to share our love, our lives, and our passions for social justice, conservation, and birds, because birds really do connect us. One of the most challenging aspects of the last couple of years is how race, ethnicity, and gender remain fundamental dividers in our culture and in our communities. Racism is profound, powerful, and it impacts our lives to the core of our being. The Black Lives Matters events of the past few years have helped to elevate this social disease in ways that are revealing to many, but are deeply rooted in those that have experienced it firsthand for generations. I come from a New England family that were abolitionists starting in the early 1800s. That doesn't make me any better, but it does mean that I've been deeply affected by these kinds of issues since I was a child. Today, the Birds of Niagara International Festival is proud to make social justice the centerpiece of how we talk about birds and conservation. Conservation activism is far from immune from the impacts of race. Our keynote speaker today, J. Drew Lanham, has been one of the most important voices of this discussion for his entire life. As an African-American man, as a wildlife ecologist, a poet, a writer, a speaker, and a distinguished professor at Clemson University, he's made a profound impact on how to embrace the full breadth of his African-American heritage and his deep kinship to nature and the adoration of birds. His focus on the ecology of songbirds and the intersections of race, place, and conservation with wild birds as the conduit of understanding really lifts us. Last May, I had the privilege of having Dr. Lanham as a guest on my Staying Connected video series. We discussed many things, and as it was prime neotropical songbird migration season, we talked about what we were both seeing in our yards, he in North Carolina and me in Buffalo. And we were seeing the same migrating birds coming north from the tropics. And we realized how truly deeply we are connected by people and birds across the globe and across the hemisphere. Dr. Lanham's leadership in this conversation is something that I am very deeply grateful for. His 2013 treatise, Rules for the Black Birder, is a powerful reminder to both the black and white cultures that being a black person with binoculars is profoundly different experience than that of a white person. His engagement this past year during the Black Lives Matters protests, and in particular, his discussions about the May 2020 Central Park racist black bird watching events surrounding Christian Cooper, a black New York City Audubon board member that was accosted when he asked a white woman to basically curb her dog in a Central Park bird habitat. That led to birding week, to black birding week. And Dr. Lanham helped to bring national attention to these issues. He also provided important social commentary regarding the police murder of the young Louisville black woman, Breonna Taylor. His book, the Home Place, Memories of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature helps to transform our cultural perceptions in the conservation community and the impacts of race relationships in growing awareness and opportunities of working together as a species to help and to enjoy the natural world. You can find links to his articles, videos, and this very important book on our J. Drew Lanham page uh, on our website. Buy the book. Dr. Lanham is an American patriot. He's a conservation hero, and he's my personal hero, and I'm very proud to introduce him here today. His topic, Coloring the Conservation Conversation, is more than a table setter for our region. It's the leading edge in how we must transform our racial preconceptions, attitudes, and actions if we're going to have a real and inclusive conservation strategy that provide a better future for coming generations. And so, without further ado, Here's an American hero and my hero, Dr. Drew Lanham.
Hi, this is Drew Lanham, and it's, again, my absolute pleasure to be with you as your keynote speaker for the Birds on the Niagara Festival. I wish I could be there in sort of your chilly, cold place. Where I am today in the northwest corner of South Carolina, it happened to be 70 degrees, so a little different, a little difference in the birds that you're probably seeing there and the birds that we are seeing here. But pretty soon, the world will turn and the birds that have been far south of you will return northward. I'd like to talk today a bit about our connections through birds. And so to, to share how our common love of these beautiful feathered beings can bring us together, a bit about how they perhaps define me, but also hopefully a great deal about how they define who it is that we are as human beings. I'll share first maybe a, a bit of a poem that I wrote for the occasion. I call it North. <clears throat> it is 13 hours and 48 minutes. That is 886.3 miles via I-77 and 79 North according to the query I easily punched into my laptop from here to there. The blue line that instantaneously appeared looked easily traversed from near to far. By car traveling at lawful speed, that's less than a day's foray. By plane, only a couple of hours, bury the inevitable delays. By bird's wings, it will likely take a bit longer than it would be by auto or gas-powered flight. But then there are the headwinds and storms that weigh heavier on feathers than on metal wings. De-icing by muscle and fat, a longer, harder process than by detergent or other surfactant. Imagine then, taking off by glint of a star, by hint of a tailwind, by some indescribably irresistible pull that says, come here, don't tarry there. You don't know where you will end up, perhaps in some safer place where you may have life more abundantly than the space you occupy now. And so, you rise, you fly to freedom as if your life depended upon it, because it does. There are others alongside in the dark, shoulder to shoulder whispering calls to keep contact. Safer in numbers than alone, better by night than in sun, brightly shining, because their predators abound. But you slip loose from the ground that shackles you. Fly north to better. Fly north to freedom. You could be bird indeed, but you might also be human being. Enslaved, looking to thrive in the midst of all that's falling down around you. 886.3 miles, days or hours, perhaps through woods and swamps over mountains, avoiding what might kill or maim or deter or re-enslave. It is a long way to go, but I would go further to find my life without limits. With unfettered wings or unshackled feet, there is no boundary I would not cross to find my way to a life undetained. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you fly away? And so in that piece, what I am attempting to reflect is this intersection between our being and birds' beings, avian being versus human being. And, and so in that, also trying to reflect a bit of history. Certainly in the Niagara area, in that region, such a rich history 
that transcends race in many ways because all of our stories are history together. But in this Black History Month, certainly, and in any month, it's appropriate to mention the strong movement to recognize the freedom of all beings, of abolitionists, of those who risk life and limb to make sure that others had liberty. And so as I think about that history, as I think about those connections, as I think about how birds connect us across hemispheres, 886.3 miles by GPS and tech, what technology tells us, in fact, is not very far certainly when it comes to seeking better than we are. And so in that, I think about what birds have meant to us as a species, that is in themselves as these creatures that inspire by song, most by flight, by their abilities to miraculously, re, miraculously reappear season after season having disappeared. But then too, allegorically, what birds mean for us in terms of freedom, in terms of choice, in terms of the ability to pick oneself up from the gravity encumbering ground and seemingly slip those bounds to go by choice where one would wish to go. And so certainly when we think of the abolitionist movement, when we think of freedom, when we think of the Underground Railroad, when we think of the great migration of folks moving from South to North to find a better situation, we come into a place of finding common ground with the birds. And I think in a present day sense, it really gives us firmer ground to stand on for a mantra that I would like for you to carry forward in your minds of same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. That we share those resources, that we share those requisites as living beings is important. And in many ways it defines why we do what we do, whether it's by hobby as a hobby or avocation, or as those of us fortunate enough to learn, earn our livings that way by vocation. So part of what I do, uh, in addition to being a cultural and conservation ornithologist, is that I write, I create essay and poems and, and, and books about birds. <clears throat> I write for birds. And so I would like to take a little bit of time now, if you will so bear with me, to tell you about my reasoning for writing for birds. It's because in, in these United States of America where racism is consistently invincible in a nation where there is in fact no region from Southeast to Northwest or any far flung corner from its Nebraskan Prairie Centroid to the Olympic rainforest to Florida Everglades and back up to Vermont's Verdants and, and then down again to the Southern border walls and the 50 states crisscross over and over and back again None of these places escapes blame as daily bouts with bias take their toll. And all that is wrong and societally entropic erodes competence. Birds are a constant salve that sometimes eases the strain. Birds for me are a distraction that make bitter human realities more bearable. Birds give me hope 
and something beyond the persistent range-wide hate that these days often comes at us in waves. Now, I'll tell you it is exhausting being a Black man in this country. It is exhausting being a Black person in this nation. It is hard to convey the damage and deep wearing impact that day after day of profiling has on one's mindset and body being. Microaggressions are these, these millions of paper cuts, these millions of paper cuts that, that bleed us out. They're the glances or the whispers that, that cause self-doubt within. There are regressive policies and rollbacks they're institutionalized prejudices that, that torture us. We have to overcome assumptions of, of our intentions and that if it isn't some above average ability to bounce or throw a ball, to dance or sing or entertain, and as long as it seems that we're doing what's coached or commanded, then there is some conditional acceptance that comes. But then should we step too far out of some readily acceptable constraint in some prescribed arena, things can turn darkly pessimistic. There are expectations that are honed on centuries of stereotyping that are entrenched in our society. And all the while, educational and economic inequities stoke an industrial prison complex. And yes, our chances, it seemed, of being slaughtered like rabid animals in the streets with no cause other than darker skin hues seem to approach coin flippable probabilities. And, and each of this, all of these things demand each day an energy that takes away from life, liberty, or a persistent pursuit of happiness. But still, yet and still, I will tell you that even in a system that seems sometimes stacked against us, the solace of nature and birds keeps me sane and safe within my own inner sanctum of wildness. I long for birds, in fact, as a, as a lover would the other half. In those times when I can't bear firsthand witness to birds, when I crave birds like water, writing has to suffice. And it's a writing for me that, that flushes Bob White quail from thickets of books or releases swallow-tailed kites to float, glide, and verse. All of that for me is sustenance. To have birds become whose rather than what's is my literary manna. When I can bring identification from field guide to feeling guide and into another's conscious as a fellow living being worthy of, of adoration, then my work for the word, the sentence, or the stanza or story is for that moment done. In those moments, taxonomy and binomial nomenclature become less, less the aim than connection to self and and conservation. The birds I daily see soaring, flying, singing, perching, hopping, nesting, they're all inspirations to keep living. And so beyond the relatively easy task of pigeonholing, that is identifying each bird by its appearance, by feather color, by beak shape, by flight speed, whether it be falcon fast or vulture slow and lazy soar, I wonder what's happened beyond what I see. And so I seek, and I know you seek some common identity between bird and, and who it is that we are. Now in doing this, I'm willfully blurring 
some lines. I'm maybe blowing past some scientifically objectified interspecific taboo, in fact. Watching some warbler sing, I'm, I'm pulled into deeper questioning that takes me past ascending trill or falling buzz. I wonder, does, does, does some behavior display or signify a healthy state? Is this bird living in optimal quality habitat? Is food plentiful? Is there cover enough to escape from predators? Are there opportunities to reproduce, to choose the mate that you want to be with, to carry on the genetic line? What bends an individual bird's choice to be in a certain place, to be in my backyard, to be far away in some wilderness? What might cause that bird to expand or contract its range beyond its present circumstance? I see a bird, I watch that bird. I absorb that bird mostly, mostly without worrying how many other birds I might see or scribe on a list beyond it. In that moment, that bird is the only one until the next one comes along. It, in fact, in that moment becomes a life bird. I also have life moments. I take in the places, whether forests and tangles and seacoast or rolling prairies, I pay closest attention to a single bird's way of being, trying to ascribe some name to it. Yes, whether it be red-winged blackbird or black phoebe, black neck, stilt, black vulture, black and white warbler, black scoter. Most are, are relatively easy identification tasks for me and I am sure for most of you. But I try as I identify birds to see myself somehow in each of them. And so I can feel some of the same struggles, envy their ability to slip the ties that bind and find freedom in their flight. And so I not only write about birds, I write for birds. And yes, sometimes I write to the birds. I write in poem and prose. I word craft in short form social media. I write the long essay. I two finger tap in minuscule mobile phone font. And sometimes I still even scribble in nearly illegible chicken scratched longhand, a script that lies scattered in notepads and, and pieces of journals as draft stories and ragged verse in between the pages of books and tacked to walls. I gather all of these words and I weave and I wrap until there is some story, some story in which I can roost and maybe even nest. And so I watch and I think about the beings that I know intimately by song and plumage and habitat. And often I write with no intent of anyone else ever seeing, but as an exercise in, in solo worship and, and mind space sacrifice. In those moments, a murmuration becomes meditation. A, a call from a plover becomes the same as alms. There is this melding of, of realities that, that causes me to lose track of time and responsibility. Now I know it is, it's, it's a selfish act and, and sometimes I don't always willingly share those moments with birds, with other human beings. Now that might be wrong hearted, but it is who I have become in this ways and this way, an introverted ornithologist who's codependent on, on ornotherapy that the birds give me without cost. So there is no need for coverage other than what my binoculars and heart can see. But I, I gladly pay anyway. Knowledge, 
as they say, is power. And the more I understand the interactions between earth and sky and birds and us, the better armed I become to defend the soil and water and air on which we all depend. How do I pay? How do we pay? We pay with attention and time. We pay by becoming more familiar with the birds than a cataloging of their numbers will ever show. Yes, we know birds by chips and chirs and self-harmonizing sonatas. We know birds by the flash of red and gold epaulets. We know birds by the miraculous journeys spanned across watery gulfs and landscapes laid desolate by progress. We know birds by the way they launch themselves into the air on a faith absent worshiping any gods except lift and thrust. We know them by home. I know them here by my native Piedmont that's fragmented into jigsaw pieces, by the Blue Ridge Escarpment just to the north, hanging on to what's left of wildness, by the low country salt marsh pluff mud just a few hours away. You know them by your northerly places, by the great inland lakes, by the cold air that pushes them down to you, by the return of migrants in the spring and summer. We know them by their proximity. We also know them by places far away. The, the tundra swans winging through moonlight, going back to some Arctic realm. We know birds by the handfuls of less than an ounce of feathers that survive predator and destructive perversion to, to perch in our fortunate view, to grace the, the puny the puny earthbound existences that pale in comparison to these miraculous journeys across hemispheres. The difficulty that I sometimes face in watching is this ever degrading context that makes the joy sometimes seem insular, especially these days. I think I'm grieving loss. I, we're all grieving loss and losing ground in, in our current state of mourning. We watch from an island surrounded by a world that seems ever again to be falling down in pieces around us. But birds are an escape sometimes. And that's important. But we can't ignore the the sea rising around us, no matter how grim that sin is. And so as I watch and as I write to the beauty of birds, I must, I must also be honest and write to the toxic streams of news that pass through my mental view. I must write to the violence, the news of wars and rumors of wars. I must write of racial injustices and hashtagged movements. It is the socio-politically fragmented and climate-inflamed Anthropocene landscape over which we are all migrating, and so we cannot ignore these headwinds that would stall us. To write about birds and not write about their struggles would be akin to, to me writing about ancestors who were not enslaved and ignoring Jim Crow and police brutality and acting as if mass incarceration never existed, that I have stake in, in two worlds, my human being and bird loving being is at times best blessing and sometimes worse curse. So that means that both suffering and celebration in ways fall to me. My black life matters most to me and I won't deny my soul's, my soul's own well-being to make birds small and just something to be seen without deeper connection and feeling. 
so then in the stream of so many causes that would seem disconnected from birds and disconcerting enough to cleave us away from nature, I write about birds. It is somehow, somehow because I need to discount the dis. Connection and concert are what we need most. Convergence, especially now. It is because birds will not profile or persecute or imprison me. Birds will not deny me clean drinking water or spew flumes of dirty air into my neighborhoods or bring fast food and liquor instead of good, whole affordable nutrition to food deserts. Birds will not widen the disparities of health, wealth, and well-being that cause my life and other black and brown lives to be shorter, less joyful, and less less valued by too many. Birds will not redline or gerrymander me into politically powerless corridors. Birds will not burn crosses in the night or fly Confederate battle flags or storm the Capitol claiming no offense intended or shout blood and soil and don't tread on me, all the while claiming that it is heritage and not hate. Birds will not tell me how impressed they are with my articulate nature, as if I am some odd creature come to the English language lately, my Negro tongue uncloven from some expectation of guttural language. Birds will not simply lump me into the other person of color because they really don't notice. Birds will not throttle me by kneeling on my throat or shoot me in the back in my I sleep and claim self-defense. And so I write about birds because they are my, our last best hope for heaven's angels here on earth or whatever sublime unearthly things, Nirvana or Brigadoon or any alleged paradise I could ever pray or hope for beyond this existence might hold. Beyond the faded disappointment of humans who fail in loving consistently, birds do not. I ask nothing of birds and they give me everything. There is no morning song I ever wish the Cardinal had undone or promise of inspiring or nest dream weaving any wren has ever broken or fallen short of. And so the only possible way for birds to fail me is if they, in fact, cease to be. For that reason alone, but, but countless others, I, we must work to make sure that such a thing does not happen, that birds persist in our lives. I can't watch a red-tailed hawk hang high on the wind and think lowly. I, I can't hear the chirps of migrants in nighttime transit over my, my drowsy head and ever fail to wonder, to wonder how miraculously intrepid these tiny intrepid travelers are. I can't witness European starlings in mass murmurating, see these unified waves of sweeping, undulating, turning, twisting, climbing, diving, wing on wing, rubbing, rustling storms of flocking birds, and just think of them as invasives that don't belong to be killed at first opportunity. I, I can't watch a skein of Canada geese honking to some wild heaven as they slide across the face of a waxing full moon and not have a tear cross the corner of my eye just because they were last seen on a golf course. So again, birds for, for me, for many of us, are an escape and a deepening tie to, to better. They, they, they're like, well, Rachel Carson explained, there are neighbors in common environmental plight. Maya Angelou knew exactly why birds behind bars sang so sweetly. 
I think I feel the convergence is coming through my own songs caught halfway between joy and woe. Yeah, Maya says, hoping for the best, prepared for the worst, and unsurprised by anything in between. So I'm going to continue to watch, but I'm also going to continue to revere birds and write. Watch, revere, and write. I'm going to love birds and all they bring to my life. And so in this heart space of mine, and I hope in yours too, that you'll find peace through birds. And so if, if there was a gift that I could give to you somehow from, from my heart to yours, I would give you the, the freedom of a moment's wild escape in some feathered thing. You don't even have to call it by name. In that witnessing, in that witnessing to transcend daily trouble, national travail, Maybe if you can't witness with your own eyes, maybe it's in, in the words written by others, maybe some words written by me to watch, revere, and repeat. To watch, revere, and repeat. And so I hope that we watch in, in some sort of abyssentric worship towards, towards a greater range expansion of, of love and of inclusion to think about how birds can make pieces whole, how they can stitch together the torn apart and the ripped asundered and, and revive and revive our, our flagging spirits. And to think about how Emily's equation of hope and feathers rings true. And so my work, our work from here on as lovers of life is to watch, revere, and repeat. To watch, revere, and repeat. So, <laughs> That's, that's a little bit of, of my mission of why I write for birds, but also I hope gives you a little bit of a tailwind to move you through what has been such a difficult year. 2020 is behind us and um, for many of us, um, years preceding it, but then there is more ahead that we have to fly through. And so whether it's the birds I know here in the Southeast or the birds you know there in the Northeast, they tie us together in this wonderful way that if we watch them, that if we revere their lives and we keep at that, that there's an opportunity for better. And, and that's my imagining. And so this, this last thing that I will share with you tonight is a piece that I wrote for um, a place a little south of you in, in Long Island, but it's about a bird that ultimately we will share. And as cold it is, as it is there now, below zero, I think, or at least feeling like it, I want you to, to close your eyes for a moment and think far south into the neotropics into places like Guatemala, 
the Honduras, the Caribbean, Northern South America. And think about a little warbler that we all know called the red star, the American red star. One balmy night, as the stars blinked on one by one, winking on in bright ink black sky that descends like a dark curtain hiding the setting sun, the wind blows warm and strong from the south. A warm tropical breeze born somewhere below Brazil and Brazil nut trees unsettles the season. Antarctic ice at first, it blows through Chile, then warms as it drops down the Andes into the great Amazon River Basin. It is a zephyr wrapped around the Tropic of Capricorn, blowing north as the night sky glows. Perhaps it is in this wind, the slightest change in light intensity, an imperceptible change that flips a switch, a hormonal switch, in the mind of a tiny songbird an American red start. Something clicks in the feathered being's thumbtack-sized brain, insisting that it leave behind the verdant bug-filled foliage of coastal mangrove forests and sable palm grove thickets on the Central American Peninsular Thumb, the Mayans call Yucatan. It's a call older than ancient cities and pyramids cast over thousands of years and legions of neotropical migratory bird generations. It is a call to leave paradise behind for those further north. To fly into the dark unknown across wide open Gulf seas to seek other shores over 600 miles distant. The red start ruffles its feathers to resettle them from the tailwind upset. It is time. With a sharp chip call, it launches from a branch on an ancient hunch. It flaps once, then 10 times in just a few seconds. It will not stop the aerial oaring for the better part of the next 24 hours. Tens of thousands more wing beats will be required as it circles the patch and orients north. The winds push the little orange and black bird, a brilliant bird, the reddish orange splotches on the sides of its pinky long black tail and wings flashing like miniature Japanese folding fans. The lift off at dusk will take the teaspoon sized being aloft with a loosely linked flock of other colorful warblers yellow-throated, black-throated blues and black-throated greens. Ceruleans and black and whites and orange crowns will rise too. Maybe a tail-wagging prairie or leaf-peaking worm eater throws in with the lot of migrants. Drab brown wood thrushes with spotted breasts and voices like flutes and fire flame scarlet tanagers and cuckoos may join the journey too. The constellations overheads are maps. There are magnets in their thimble heads helping to find waypoints instinctively better than any GPS. They see leftover sunlight we thought gone the evening before, still shining bright on the horizon like signposts. They'll look down from a few hundred, maybe a couple of thousand feet high, down on seascapes and landscapes as we sleep and drowsily dream. Maybe seeing something familiar or remembering the routes etched in hard by time and trial and soft wired, but learned. Two. They will all fly nonstop over wide open water with little or no place to land except fishing boats or perhaps oil platforms that ironically offer some brief resting respite. Most will journey on through the night, wings never stopping because soaring or sailing is no option for a warbler. It's a persistent pushing on through dark into dawn. With the sun rising on their right wings, they adjust to keep on course. North, north, north. 
They must now run the gauntlet past predatory sharp taloned falcons and greedy gulls that come swooping in at first light. The furcular fat put on between the minuscule wishbones from frenzied feedings on caterpillars and bugs, berries and grubs is almost spent after 14 hours of heroic flight. It was all possible because of high calorie lipid fuel burned hot by avian hearts beating a thousand times times a minute, tensing muscles that fed the spinning wings. Migratory engines rev high. With dawn coming, the guiding stars fade. Ahead, a sandy spit, perhaps. Dauphin Island or South Padre Beach looms as first respite. The little male red start flies bravely on pushed to nearly 40 miles per hour by the fortunate tailwind. He flies barely above the surf now, within reach of a hungry Dorado fish that, if ambitious, could leap from the depths to snatch him from the air. The land he seeks with millions of other birds is now within reach. Only a few hundred thousand more wing beats. But many will perish before four-toed perching feet can grasp around again and give wings rest. Storms will drench many into drowning. Others will become prey. The red start has been lucky. A wax myrtle branch will have to do for now. It lands, reshuffles its feathers, plucks a caterpillar, a spider, tucks its head beneath a wing. There is hardly any fat fuel left. Are you wondering why Red Star and all the rest would make the perilous journey across half a globe? It is because they seek better than where they come from. And so in this story of a red starts journey, maybe you had an opportunity to imagine, at least for now, someplace warmer, but also know that better days are coming. And I think those better days come on the wings of birds. If we'll allow ourselves to transcend our own being, to think beyond our feet on the ground to wings in the stars, there's the opportunity for us to dream beyond this present time. I'm so grateful to you for being here, there, tonight where you are. Again, I look very much forward to the time that I can return to, to, to a place that I, I dearly love and have grown to love even more over the past couple of years. And so thank you for having me there virtually. Thank you for all that you do for the birds and for one another. And so with that, I'm going to let you all go back to finding those scoters and snowy owls and long-tailed ducks and northern shrikes that um, it's very hard or nearly impossible certainly for a northern shrike to find here now. Instead, I'll look for my loggerhead shrikes. I'll look for my gadwall and look forward to the day soon when we can share red starts together. So thank you. Please stay safe, be well, and I will look forward to seeing you in better days to come. Take care.
Wow, Drew, that was um, that was stunning and beautiful. And what a great keynote. So thank you so much. I mean, you hit so many things. I mean, if we had, if I had heard your presentation before we designed our conference, I would have designed it around what you said. But you know what? <laughs> we designed it around what you said without even hearing it. We, I, Jay, I, was it was it okay? Oh man, it was great. It was fantastic. It was it was perfect. Um, I mean, your your poetry, your your understanding, your willingness to share uh, is so important. And your knowledge of birds and migration and humanity, um, it's exactly its exactly the notes we need and want. And thank you so much. 